Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fruitful Trees. And I'm really excited about today's guest. Today, I have a friend of mine uh, who lives in Hawaii. His name's Jeremy Saffron. Say hello, Jeremy, to the audience. Hello, audience. Good to see you. <laughs> uh, what island in, in Hawaii are you on? I'm on the island of Maui, which is kind of considered the second island here in Hawaii. And uh, it's the uh, island that has Haleakala Mountain on it. We don't have an active volcano. The volcano here is actually dormant. Now, this is really... Uh, uh, a special moment for me because for those of you that are watching know how much I love exotic fruits and fruit trees and Jeremy and myself uh, a very long time ago we, we got involved to, to a healthy vegan raw food diet and Jeremy had moved to Maui and opened up a restaurant a raw food restaurant and I was so excited to go there and I went there and I had some of my fir first taste of different exotic fruits I've never had I had egg fruit and I had star fruit kamito and they were amazing. And I had other fruits as well, but it was Jeremy's restaurant. He made an egg fruit pie and star fruit I had right up the tree. And I was blown away. I had a, I had a one day grow fruit trees. And yeah. Jeremy has also expanded now. He no longer has a raw food restaurant, but he has a, a farm, a, a garden, a property that's amazing. So tell us a little about your, what you got there now. And then we're going to hear, we're going to see some of his fruit trees today, because this man's growing durian and other trees. But tell us about how big is your farm and tell us a little about it. Yeah, uh, Avalau Farm here is a 30 acre farm uh, hidden in the hills of Haiku. We're actually one of the highest elevation properties in Haiku. We're uh, considered like the entry to the north side of Haleakala. There's four entries to it and we're the North Shore entry. And the forest here is a 62,000 acre state reserve that you can see the sun rising behind me above that forest. It goes all the way to Hana. And actually above us, you can possibly see the mountain. I don't know if the glare is too much back there, but the Haleakala Mountain is behind me and there's nothing above me to the top of the mountain. The property is host to all sorts of creatures and animals. We have alpacas, we have horses, uh, there's ancient waterfalls, there's ancient caves here. Uh, there's a lot of old stuff from the Chinese who were here as well as from the Hawaiians who are here. Um, the caves themselves were used for charcoal making, for turning the uh, strawberry guava trees into charcoal. So, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff that goes on with the property here itself. You know, a lot of people come here for our annual fairy festival, for our uh, historic haunted hike that we do, of course, for our sauna club and spa, and uh, to visit all the animals. Possibly we'll get to see a couple animals behind me. I think everybody's down here grazing right now. We have some uh, alpacas and horses that are kind of, everybody roams free on my property too. This 30 acre property is mostly fenced, but partly not, but the animals just love it here. So they don't actually ever leave. Uh, they're hidden here kind of behind the bushes, but I mean, we'll get a little closer to get to see a couple of alpaca and even a baby alpaca back there. Wow. See, wow. An animals are useful for me too, because they provide a lot of fertilizer, you know, out here. And so it's kind of like one of the cool things about it so yeah here now behind me you can kind of get a glimpse of some of the alpacas grazing and wow. originally i was told alpacas only eat grass um which they mostly do eat grass as you can see they're mostly all eating grass but they actually figured out how to eat my fruits and so the, wow. there's a couple of fruits that they're really into right now the strawberry guava being one of the fruits that they eat uh recently they've tried to eat a macadamia nut which didn't work out well so they spit it out but they were like chewing on it, which I thought was strange. And uh, you had mentioned earlier, egg fruits, canistels. Yes. Canisteru. Now, yeah, do you know, so, so yeah, every, uh, your farm sounds amazing. I'm going to put a link below to it, but everyone here is excited to know what people are growing in Hawaii. And, and you are like the man, because how many acres of, of, do you have there? I have 30 acres. 30 acres and, and a lot of fruit trees. So what kind of canistel is that in your hand? What variety? Well, that's what I'm trying to show you, the two varieties here um, that are kind of most common on Maui. You can see they're very different looking. One of them is this smaller variety here. Let me put the big variety down and we'll just look at the small one for a moment. So the smaller variety, I don't know if you see the hook. See how it has a yes. point, but the point isn't straight. The point actually hooks. And so when a fruit hooks here in Hawaii, and we have a lot of hooked fruit here, tons and tons of varieties will make this hook it means it's from Asia, which is really strange. All of our hooked varieties in Hawaii, so it doesn't matter if it's you know egg fruit or star apples or mangoes or any fruit that grows here, they have a hook at the bottom, a curve, and it means that they came from Asia. I, I don't know why, but that's just the way. Whereas this 
larger one, uh, it seems like it's a round variety and it doesn't have the hook. The point just goes straight out from it, you know, from whatever side you're looking at. So that's like a, a different, more classical variety of egg fruit. I don't actually know the names of these two varieties, but they're the two common varieties that you see here all the time. The smaller one is much creamier. So if you want the creamy kind of egg fruit, that's going to be like spreadable and very soft. You want that small kind, the, the Asian kind. And if you want something that's going to crack and more be like dry, powdery, crumbly, kind of heading almost into other ends of the Puteria family, uh, then you're going to want that round variety, which is a better variety for you know, kind of cakes or for if you're making uh, crumbly things or if you want to make toppings. Um, I like the smaller variety for making things like chocolate chips that'll like melt in your mouth. I make dehydrated uh, chocolate chips out of the egg fruit. And, uh, but I like the other variety for the egg fruit pie because it gives this more cakey texture to it and, and it kind of almost cracks open like a hard boiled egg or something. So, so those wow. are my two favorites out here for the egg fruits. Okay, well, tell us about your, your, your fruit trees. When you moved out there, were there fruit trees on a property or did you plant everything you have? Well, this property is an old Chinese property. So because of that, there was the, what the Chinese had brought here. And the Chinese had brought the strawberry guava. They actually had brought a fruit tree out here to make charcoal out of, but also to do building and construction and also to feed their livestock. So they had brought this out here in order to do many, many things. So it became, a, they consider it invasive, but I don't consider anything invasive that's useful. So um, it's, you know, overgrown, it's mismanaged, let's say is a better term for it. And it was a mismanaged thing after the Chinese left in the 1920s, it seemed to kind of take over areas, including my entire property. So when I got this property, it was completely covered in strawberry guava. There was a couple of ancient mango trees, a couple of ancient koa trees, and a lot of camphor, which is what people make tiger balm for healing your sore muscles. The Chinese had that plant here because they worked so hard. They needed something to kind of take care of themselves with as a medicine. So, you know, that was mostly what was here. Now, I planted 150 fruit trees on the property of exotics beyond what they originally had here as far as uh, strawberry guava and also cattle guava. There was a lot of cattle guava here, which is more like a yellow common guava. And we use both of those to make vinegar. I use them to feed my animals. We use the wood from them. We make jams from them. We make juice from it. I mean, the strawberry guava is fantastic. Very high vitamin C source. Wow. That's just amazing. So what got you into growing fruit trees? Well, did you just decide I want to go grow <laughs> fruit trees or was there something that drove you to move to Hawaii and grow fruit trees? That, that's a great question, Paul. Thank you. Um, you know, really what it was for me is I have always been a nature creature. Like I've always been very oriented towards nature, towards uh, survivalist kind of techniques as just a boy scout as a kid, towards camping out in the woods, towards foraging. I, I remember I was sent to a summer camp and I wasn't sure about like the food that they were feeding us. I wasn't used to that, but I saw blueberry bushes in the woods and I lived for like probably the first couple of weeks at that summer camp just on blueberries I was picking myself, you know, and my, my parents, my grandparents, people had always introduced me to foraging. So when I came to Hawaii, I was already really forage oriented and I saw all these trees with fruit all over them. And it was the strangest thing too, because when I got here, the grandparents, the, the generation, two generations ago had planted those trees and loved them. That was like their treasure, you know, 60, 80 years ago, they brought these from the foreign countries with them. When they first came to Hawaii and first came to America, planted these amazing trees, loved it, brought like their culture, brought something from home that meant something. The kids didn't care and the grandkids had no clue. So when I got here, I'd go to these houses and say, why is your fruit dropping all over the ground? What's going on? And they say, nobody wants it. And I say, well, can I pick this up? And they say, oh, please. I mean, it's a mess and there's fruit flies everywhere. And it would, you would help me so much if you could pick up this fruit. And so I would just pick up everybody's fruit all over this island. I would just drive around filling my truck every single day with fruit. And I'd use it in the restaurant. I had a restaurant, so I would use all that fruit in the restaurant. And it just made me into this ultimate forager here. I just got so into wow. foraging fruit. And so that educated me. I'd spend time with the Filipinos. I'd spend time with the Micronesians. I'd spend time with the old Hawaiians. And I'd learn what was valuable to them. And so because I knew about those fruits, when I got property, the first thing I did was seek out all those people and say, hey, I'm going to get, can I get a tree from you? Can I get a keiki? It's a, a baby fruit tree. You know, can I get seed from you? And I planted everything I could. Wow. And how long have you been on the property now? <laughs> 20 years. So, so a lot of the trees are pretty grown now and fruiting. Yes, a lot of the trees are fruiting. 
10 years is where fruit trees usually start fruiting in Hawaii. But because of my lack of sun, a lot of it was about 15 because I have a, a huge forest next to me. So, okay. so now uh, I'm in uh, I'm in a, a tropical zone here in South Florida. What do you know what growing zone you're in there in Hawaii? I think I'm in zone 11. Zone 11. Okay. Zone 11, I think, but it could be like 12A. You know, like somebody said something to me about 11A or 12, 11D or 12A was what okay. somebody had said. I went, I went and looked too. You had mentioned it. So I was like, I better look. So, so very cool. So tell us, uh, tell us some of the things you're growing, your most popular fruits. I know, well, you first off, so one thing you grow that, that we can't grow here is durian. You grow durian. You have trees, right? I have durian trees. Yes. And we have, you know, a couple really special durian trees from this guy out in Nahiku who was on that, you know, durian show and everything. And I have his caramel variety. Once I started eating that, I actually stopped eating most other durian because that variety is so special. It's like vanilla caramel. It doesn't have any of the, the garlic hints or onion. It doesn't have any of that. It's just like pure caramel durian. It's really, really good. I have to hike. It's next to George Harrison's old property. And I have to hike a mile into the jungle through a mosquito infested forest to get these durian out of there and hike them out. And this guy calls people every year and I bring huge crews out there and we hike. One year we hiked 360 pounds of durian out of there on our backs. <laughs> wow. Wow. So that's, so that's on his property. What about your property? Do you have any fruiting durian trees? I just have the trees, not fruiting. The trees grow very slowly here. They're probably about four years old or five years old and they'll need to get to 10. The mistake I was making early on is that the trees would sprout. All his seeds would sprout. I put them in pots. I would grow them in pots. And then at three years old, I'd move them to the ground and they would instantly die. And they really have a very sensitive tap root is what I learned. And it's the best thing to do is to never move a durian. Like start it in the ground and let it grow right there and don't move it. Wow. You know, and that's what I've done. And now I have trees that are four and five years old, maybe wow. even one that might be six years old. So, you know, it, it did work out, but it took me a while to learn that, you know, because I was like, oh, I got to take care of them. I have to put them in my nursery. I have to put them in a pot and, you know, have them over here. And no, they, what my, their favorite spot is where it's really wet, but they have drainage. So it's like on a hill that all my water goes by, but no water sits there. It just moves by them. They love it. They're growing super strong, really healthy, really hardy. I probably should keep the alpaca away from them, but otherwise they uh -huh. seem really good. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, here in Florida, probably the two most popular common things we have is mangoes and avocados. Tell us about your mangoes. What kind of mangoes are you growing out there? And feel free yeah, well, to show us any trees you're passing if you want. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. We're here in the orchard again right now. Well, the mangoes that we do, I mean, the keat is a, a winter mango that we have out here that people like. It's kind of a larger mango, like the size of your head. It's like a big fatty. Uh, the Fairchild, which is a small mango, it's a summertime mango. It's very yellow, very lemony. And I like that a lot. I have the, the common mango, not the common Hawaii mango, but like the Hayden that most people know as the mango might be a Raposa. And then I have the Mapalehu, the Mapalehu being my favorite mango in the world. It's a mango that has a nipple on it. So you can very visually see the difference because it has a spike that sticks out the end of the mango. And, uh, you know, so that one's kind of my favorite here. It likes it a little drier than my place, but it's okay here. It's doing well. And then there's common mangoes. As I mentioned, when I bought the property, there's 150 year old, what we call common mango here, which is a tiny little mango. It's got maybe one bite. They're kind of juicy. If you're in the forest and you find them, it's nice. It's like a nice little snack, but it's not like anything you're taking to market with you. Now, of all the mango varieties, what made you pick those four? Well, Mapale, who's my favorite mango in the world. So that's why I picked that one. It was developed on the island of Molokai. It's actually a Hawaiian developed mango. Um, the Fairchild, I liked it because of the size and it seemed kind of a little earlier in the summer. So it was more bug resistant because of that. Although I don't have any bug problems, but I didn't know that when I planted it. It gets too cold here for those kind of bugs. I don't have any bugs that have attacked my mangoes or anything. And then uh, the Hayden was just common. Somebody gave me that. It's an easy tree to get. Everybody has them. Someone was just like, here, have a mango tree. I think it was maybe even a housewarming gift. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the key was because of winter. It was because I was like, oh, I want a mango in the winter. Then I'm going to have a mango in the off season. Usually these days, there's an old timer, this guy, Peter Sisko, one of the best growers in the state of Hawaii. He's too old to pick his trees and he likes me a lot. So he lets me come pick and I climb his trees. I climb his trees 
and go pick all his mangoes. I mean, we filled buckets and buckets. We're filling like 10 to 15 five gallon buckets out of those trees. Wow. And he wants me to give them all away too. He doesn't like them to be sold. He just lets me come and pick and then I give them to everybody. Wow. Now there's a, a mango from Hawaii that I absolutely love. I got the tree and uh, there's a local farm here that has a tree. It's from Maui. It's called ST Maui. I don't know oh, if you've yeah, heard of it. Maui. That's from yeah. uh, Yee's. That's Yee's Orchard has that, that tree. Uh, have you yeah, tasted it? That's a great it? mango. Absolutely that's a great mango. amazing. That's, yeah. yeah, the gold flow related. That's related to Miss, Mr. Yee is this guy from Kihei here who wrote one of the best books on mangoes. He actually wrote the university course for exotic agriculture here back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. He was like the guy. And he developed so much at that ag park that the mangoes he has, the Golden Glow is one of those famous in the state. And he did tons of strains and development of different varieties. I go there like once a month and stop by and they have a whole spread of like all their different mangoes out. Even winter mangoes, they're a cool spot. Yee's Orchard. Nice, nice, nice. Well, uh, uh, I see all those trees you're passing. Uh, <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, so how far it, apart? It, 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 we could get into, I don't have any ripe Relenia today because I think I already took them to the market yesterday. We're here with the, you wow. know, green Relenias. Well, we'll look though. We might come upon maybe in one of the other trees. Wow, look at that. So you got a lot of Anonas out there? A lot. Yeah. I mean, my property loves Anona. It loves citrus. It loves avocado. You know, it, it's a, the mountain apple. Do you guys get into Oh, here I mountain apple. No, we don't have you know that, about that. No, no. Okay, so is that like a sour here, sap? No, this is the mountain apple, and I, I wish I could find you an actual like you can see the flowers before they open, but when they open, it's like a bright red firework. It looks like a big bright red burst of fireworks, and the fruit is phenomenal, phenomenal. Wow. They are like the juiciest little soft apples how the apples that we have in America are hard apples. You like crunch them, right? This is a soft apple. It's like super juicy and sweet and so soft, very perfumey even in its flavor. You know, it has much higher flavors than the uh, regular apple that's more bland. Uh, how, far, how, far, here? how far apart do you plant your trees? <laughs> Not far enough. <laughs> are you running that's into a prob problem? You probably pregnant? everybody's answer is not far enough. 10 feet was my original plan. That's what I was told by a lot of agriculturalists was 10 feet would work and 10 feet doesn't work. 20 feet is actually probably closer to correct. Um, but it's going to depend on varieties. Now I've taken to pruning trees away from each other and creating space. So you can even see like I'm walking between two crowns. This is this tree, this is that tree. But I keep them kind of separate. You know, I try to make sure, see here, we're going to walk through again. Like between, I'm between two trees, that side and that side. Oops, I've flipped the phone around. But, um, you know, so you can see, I kind of try to keep them separate. But then there's problems. Like, where is this problem? This, this is an avocado that volunteered in the middle of a long gone. You know, so wow. I have to make a heavy choice there, but it's probably for the long gone. Yeah. Probably is. You know, yeah. only because the avocado, it's a thousand pounds of fruit per tree when they're in full production. So, you know, it, it's a, a large producer. The long run doesn't do that. So I'd rather give it the chance to make a little bit of fruit that it's going to, because I have a lot of avocado trees. My whole road is avocado trees. And what did I find here? Well, well tell yeah. us about your avocados. What varieties of avocados do you have? Oh, I, well, we have like the traditional Haas that everybody likes. You know, that was an easy one to get. And everybody had it. We have the charwool. I don't know if you guys have charwool there. No. Is that no? So the charwool is like a green, smoother hoss. The, the flavor is almost the same. It's basically a hoss, but it's green instead of black, and it, it still has the bumps, but a little bit less of the bumps. And so we have that one here. We have, I mean, I have so many avocados. We have the Yamagata, which is probably my favorite variety of all avocados. Yamagata is probably my number one. It's big, it's round. But the number one reason that I'm going to list it as my favorite is I've never had one go bad. And that's a, an interesting thing to say because my hosses and my charwolves both have problems. Sometimes, some years, there's a bad spot or a bruise or a, a bump or strings or you know something every year that I'm like, oh, they weren't all perfect. But that Yamagata, I've never seen anything go wrong. I'm like, how is it? I think it's the thickness of the shell. You know, there's like, um, there's like the cannonball kind of avocados 
which is what Yamagata more is. And then there's the alligator pear, right? Alligator pear, more Jamaican, you know, Caribbean style, which is like Haas or Charwolf, like they're pear shaped and they're like rougher, like an alligator skin. Whereas the Yamagata, smooth and, and round, you know? So preferred Hashimoto, very similar variety out here. I like it. The skin's a little thinner, but I do like that variety as well out here. Um, you know, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, that, that silly one that somebody gave me, what's it called? The, the reed? Reed. Yeah, oh, reed. Wow. Wow. Reed, reed but it delicious. doesn't work out here. The reed wow. is like, it, it, in California, it's a phenomenal avocado. Yes. I love it. Yes. There's California. something wrong here in Hawaii and it doesn't turn out the same. Yeah. You know, like yeah. there's some, some yeah. plants don't work out in Hawaii. I think it might be our calcium deficiency is affecting that plant. And so I'm going to try and see if I can like affect its flavor. It's a good plant here, but everybody that has the reed variety, it doesn't work out for them. The flavor is like not, there's no flavor. It's just like a water avocado here. Yeah, we, 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 we can grow greed here too, but it doesn't do as well as the others. It's more of a California avocado. Just it general. seems like it's a California avocado. It so, is. That's must so be what it is. How big do you let your avocado trees and your trees grow in generally? Do you cut them back at all? Or do you let them grow as tall as they want to be? Well, the avocado trees, I let them go as tall as they want. They're part of my road. Like they line the entire roadway and we have a cliff at the edge of the road. So they're kind of acting as a guardrail, holding the road together. And so I let them get as big as they possibly want. The bigger they are, the bigger the roots and the stronger they hold the road together. Plus it gives everybody easy access to picking them. Um, but, you know, a lot of my other trees, like especially the white sapote, I prune back. Um, you know, some of like, that's probably the one that I prune back the most. Is the How sapote. tall do you like to keep it? Oh, I don't know, 20 feet, 15, 20 feet, these things. And then you bring know. it back 20 feet. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had to get one of those electric pole saw pruners, like an electric pole saw thing. Although my favorite tool is the cutter grabber. Do you have that tool? Uh, the cutter grabber. I mean, it sounds like I do, but I don't know. I mean, Hawaii. Well, it, it, lets, it, it extends really far. I can extend yeah. it up to 20 feet. And at the end of it, where it cuts, it has a cutting tool that has a little grab. So I can face it one direction, it'll just cut fruit off the tree or cut branches. I can just yeah. use it as a pruner. But if I flip it the other way, when I cut it, it holds the mango. So I just reach up, I grab a mango That's and the, I can lower it to the those, ground. Those big orange poles, right? Well, it's like a pole with a grabber. It has a, a claw that grabs and cuts the fruit off. So I reach behind each relenia and it cuts off the relenia wow. and I can just carry it down to the ground. It holds onto it. Once it's cut it off, wow. it snaps it and holds it and puts it down. Wow, so tell it's a gr great tool, great tool. So are all your avocados on a public road? No, no, I, I have a mile long driveway that I call oh, a wow. road. Wow. <laughs> so my okay. driveway is a mile long dirt road. And uh, so because of that, I planted the entire thing in order to okay. get back to my farm. So you mentioned white sapote. Wow. How many white sapote trees and varieties do you have? Oh, uh, there's so many here. People gave me a lot of that. It's very common here. It's almost a weed. Um, so I probably have, you know, a dozen or more white sapote here and, you know, they produce different varieties of fruits. Like some produce a, a, a donut fruit, like the donut peaches, you know, like flat and some produce a round fruit that are like completely circular or spherical. Some produce a very large fruit. One of them produces a seedless fruit, which is very interesting. Or maybe it's just, I've never found one with a seed wow. on that tree yet. So, you know, some of them produce very large seeds. I, I'm, I'm told that it's actually a member of the citrus family. So, you know, interesting thing to know about that plant is the seed itself is a citrus. Even though it's called a sapote, it's not actually a saponache at all. Really? So, very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, they're, they're a wonderful fruit, and uh, that's great. And then you let them grow, but you cut those back a little. What about the relenia? You said you have those. Do you have many of those trees? A lot of relenia. We have 40 relenia trees here on the property. Relenia grows wild here again. Like a lot of these things, if I just break off a branch and stick it in the ground, it just grows. And do you, so, do you water your trees a lot or you don't have to water? Never, never, not once. Not wow. one. One year I had to carry water in my 20 years, but that was about it. And, wow, uh, even when you're growing them, because it's always, it rains every day there, right? It rains every day. It rains every day here. In the summer, this last year, I did manage to get a couple of months without rain, but the ground is so wet that it was just absorbing water from the ground, everything, you know? What about my so, main sapote? Mame, we got one. The tree's a little small. I had to dig it up and put it back. There's jackfruit seeds on the ground below me. Um, that definitely means there's going to be big jackfruits if we climb up this ladder. Here's one jackfruit. 
that you can see. How many see. jackfruits do you have? How many jackfruit trees? Oh, probably 10 jackfruit trees. It's another one that people gave me a lot of early on. So there you can see another huge, I don't know if you can get the perspective on how big that is, but that, oh, it smells so much. Oh, it's so wow. good, man. It smells so good. Are these seedlings right or varieties? <laughs> yeah. Are, they, are these seedlings or uh, grafted ones? No, these are seedlings. A lot of this stuff is, you know, people knew when I had originally gotten this property, 30 acres. So friends came and brought me trees of things like white sapote, jackfruit that you could just get just about anywhere on Maui. They're like keikis all over. Keiki means little tree. Uh, wow. I, or child even here, I actually yesterday on a wild mission to see some other alpacas dug up incredible macadamia nut trees on this lady's property. She had the double. Do you know about the double macadamia? No, it's but it two, sounds like they grow two in one shell. <laughs> two in one shell, exactly. Wow. It grows two and they're like little turtle halves. Like instead of a round ball, it's like flat on one side and round on the other side and they both fit together in the shell. So it's like wow. two nuts in there. How, it's how really many, cool. How many macadamia nut trees do you have? Well, I have three that are little that I have. They're just the regular, you know, common variety. But then yesterday I drug, dug up six more trees at that lady's place and I got them in pots right now. So I hope they're going to, you know, stabilize and be good. And I'll throw them in the ground too. They were pretty big. I had the old uh, Transylvanian cowboy with me yesterday. And so he was like, rawr. He dove in with my shovel and managed to pull some really huge ones out of the ground. That guy's a, a beast. <laughs> so, wow. Well, what do you do with all the fruit that you harvest? Uh, mostly we actually eat about a third of it. We trade a third of it and we probably sell a third of it. You know, it's probably what goes on. Okay. Certain things okay. end up here, mostly going into my belly. <laughs> but a lot okay. of things make it to the farmer's market. Now, what what can't you grow out there? Like, I know you're in Hawaii and you grow a lot of things, but what's a fruit that you wish you could grow, but you just can't grow out there? Coconuts. Sadly, coconuts do grow in Hawaii, but my farm's too high elevation. I'm just past it. The line for coconuts, oops, dang, my power keeps down. The line for coconuts is 1,500 feet, and I'm at 1,600 feet. Now, I do have two coconut trees that are here, both of which came from 1,000 feet like some of the higher coconuts on Maui. So I brought those up here in an attempt to grow them and they may work out, but they struggle. You know, they, they grow, but I don't think they'll ever make nuts wow. unless we had a really, really warm year. Uh, mm -hmm. I get 45 degrees up here. So because that I do grow blueberries, you know, and all sorts of berries, strawberries and raspberries. I grow all the berries. I grow apples and plums. Uh, so because I'm right at that border where you can grow mainland kind of fruit as well as grow Hawaii fruit. But the one that struggles for me yeah, it seems to be as the coconut is hard. Also, papayas in the winter, my production is like maybe one papaya a week, maybe. And in the summer, it's like three or four every day, you know? Wow. So, I mean, I get a lot of papayas in the summer when it's nice weather here. But when it's wintry like this, I, I can, you know, barely get them. But there's no bugs. So, again, that's kind of the benefit of having this little bit of winter that I have. And it's only 45 degrees for like maybe a dozen nights and it's 50 degrees and you know it's not the worst winter you have to do you have to spray it do you spray your trees with anything never the one thing i have to do is give them calcium calcium is the one nutrient that we don't really have up here um i'm just trying to go in another orchard here right now it's a newer orchard though but it has a lot of flowering lychee now here's a mango we just came upon here's a mango tree behind me that you can see it's not a very huge mango tree but it's you know sizable it's pretty good and uh, it made flowers, but as you can see, look, the flower didn't work out. I don't know if you can see that, but yeah. it, it, it got too cold up here. Sometimes it does that on the mango flower. So let's see. Oh, we just found a giant tortoise. So let's go see if we can meet him for a second. I know you have him in Florida too. But... Wow. So here's a giant tortoise, and he would love to eat fruit. If we let him eat the fruit, he'd eat the fruit. But he mostly eats grasses. He's mostly a grass eater in here. Uh, but fertilizer, phenomenal. Phenomenal. They just eat grass. They digest it. And they leave you a big, big, like, grass ball every day. And you just throw that in some water, stir it around, pour it around the fruit tree. Fantastic fertilizer. One of my favorites here. So with all the trees you've had and all the exotic fruits you've tasted, uh, what are your favorite three trees? If you could have only three trees on your house, what would they be? <laughs> three trees. Gosh, 
Well, I'm going to go for avocado number one, thousand pounds of fruit, most prolific, no pests, no parasites, no problems, no work. So avocado has got to go high on my list of, because of where I live. Now, if I lived somewhere else, you know, I'd be picking the prickly pear because that's my favorite fruit in the world, but it will not grow here. I live in the jungle and it grows in the desert. Um, but I'd pick as a, a second tree to grow up here would be the lychee. Uh, the lychee in my area produces so well just down the street from me is a 30 acre, 200 tree lychee orchard, largest lychee orchard in the state, La Du lychees from this French lady. And I pick there every year. Uh, just because of how much they produce, I'd probably pick that as my second choice for up here in the area that I'm at. And third, I'm going to go for Relenia, only because it grows so well and I have so many and it's so nice. So yeah, avocado, you know, Relenia and lychee. Wow. If I had to pick three, if I had to pick three trees to grow here, those would probably be the three that I would choose, you know, for where I am. And uh this is another very useful plant that I'm, I'm breaking it off here. As you can see, I'm sort of ripping off pieces of this plant. Ah, rah, I break the plant, right? And this plant is, is like a cut leaf. This is what we call a gliracidia, and it's a nitrogen fixer. And I just throw it on the ground. I just break it off, and I throw it on the ground under the trees, and it feeds all the trees. It's like a great plant fertilizer. So you just you know grow these next to every fruit tree, and I just break off a piece and stick it in the ground. It'll grow, and it's a great way to feed my trees. Wow. You know, that's very interesting that you said that about the trees that you would grow because they grow there. Like you mentioned, prickly pear is your favorite, but it can't grow there. Coconut, you can't grow there. But you talk about the trees that you can grow. When I teach about the trees, I tell people what's your goal, because me being still a raw food vegan, my goal is to get the most food per tree as possible. So there's something here called a strawberry, uh, a, a strawberry tree tree. It's a Jamaican strawberry. I don't know if you have them there. They taste like Captain Crunch. Yeah, I got it right here. We're going to walk on so, it right now. There we so, go. Panama berry. We call it Panama yeah. berry here. So I don't, so for me, I don't grow that because they, they're not really a substance of food. They're more like a snack and they, they don't achieve my goal in my small grounds. So it's interesting yeah. that you say that what grows best for you and each person, we have to grow what's going to meet our goals. Some people just want to grow the most exotic things they can find and they're not even interested in eating it. They just want to have that, that idea that they grew something that was challenging. For me, exactly, exactly. That doesn't happen. And then for you, you mentioned those three foods, which is which is, uh, you know, you're interesting. Uh, but thankfully, you can grow many different uh, trees and and different types. And now, do you have any problems with the the public around you taking food ever? <laughs> no, I mean I'm a I'm a known character first of all, so people don't mess around because of that. Um, I kind of have a history, but uh, also. I, I'm hard to get to, you know what I mean? Like on the highest elevation property on the North shore of Maui, you know, like you have to go up a, uh, you have to get to like a really hard to get to area. And then you have to go up a mile long, super steep paved road. Then there's an electric gate that you have to get through. Then you have to go across a giant gulch. That's like super steep and no cars are making it across there unless you're four wheel drive. It's all mud. Then when you make it across there, there's another gate. Then you have to make it past the caves. And I have like animals that are guardians, like the alpaca. If you come onto my property and he don't know you, he's going to go wiki, 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 wiki. He makes a crazy noise, you know, wow. like he's like an alarm system. And like the, the dogs, they're going to bark. Well, so, so I mean, with you everything know, you got there, <laughs> people don't mess around. With people everything you got there. So you got uh, no public people coming on your property. You got no, no, you don't need pesticide. You don't need rain. You can grow pretty nope. much anything you want there. What's what's the challenging that you have there? What's a challenge that you have with the do you have any natural predators like uh, raccoons or things like that? What's your challenge? No, there? no my, my animals keep all the deer and pigs off the property so they can't even get in here. You know, like all the deer and pigs are pretty much kept away because of my animal smells and sounds and, you know, they're kind of aggressive. But my problem is it's too wet, man. My problem is it, it rains so much that like plants, they will get root rot and they'll like drown and like they don't get sun. Like things, I've had trees grow mold. Like one of the jobs around here when people come and want work is like go rub all the trees with a cloth, you know, to get all the moss and, and mold and everything off the wow. trees. Wow. You know, so I mean, that, that's our biggest problem. I got a contract from the state this last year and I don't know, it's probably too glared out over there to see 
but I got a contract to cut the forest back. So the forest was like right at the edge of my property and creating a lot of darkness and a lot of moss and everything coming out of that forest. And they gave me permission to cut it 50 feet back. So that gave me a lot more sun, a lot more better weather. So things are a lot better here because of that. But the wetness has been a problem. And before that, the problem was my own animals and my poor fencing. I mean, now I don't have goats anymore. I just have these sheep and alpacas and things that don't eat my fruit trees. But early on, everyone's eating the fruit trees. Where are you eating a fruit tree? now? this one doesn't eat fruit trees. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hi. That, that's so, amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, so, you know, but these guys give me a lot of fertilizer and they, they, they help the fruit trees. What did you say? Are you saying that? Somebody had something to say. <laughs> now, now, do you do anything by mail if people want to get not just fruit, but seeds? Do you ship seeds if people are interested or no? Um, I, I haven't done that, but I know that that's a popular thing right now. And people do do that from here. So I know that that does go on. I could probably do it. I'm not sure what the USDA thinks about that. We'd have to inquire. So, so, so you've been there a long time now. Have you traveled uh, around the world looking at farms or do you pretty much just stay where you're at? No, I travel and I look at a lot of farms. I look at a lot of farms that have communities on them and how they function. And I like a lot of design, looking at the design on some of those systems. Um, you know, Domenhor being one of my favorites that I visited. Um, but I mean, I visited a lot of different communities and a different farm, especially here in the state of Hawaii. I get the opportunity to go visit different people and, you know, see how they've done it and see what they do with their places. And so that's pretty cool, you know, so, so I do visit. Are there a lot of other people like you that uh, just own property and grow a lot of trees or are you pretty unique? No, there's there's a fair number of people here. I'd say there's good, you know, 50 to 100 people in Hawaii that are growing on that level, on this kind of level, you know. So, wow. wow. And you guys, now, but you all, you guys grow pretty much the same things, right? Well, elevation. Elevation determines a lot of what people are growing, you know, so you know we have 22 climate zones in hawaii and so because we have so many different climates it affects what you can grow the people in the desert are growing those cactuses that i love you know and they grow a lot of other things over there too like they have different varieties of mangoes and uh i'm just seeing if we can find any cactuses right now Ooh, purple ones so here's here's the purple prickly pear that i pick so why do you like green. prickly pear so much? Oh, they're so good. Like it's it's like sweet aloe almost, you know? It's like super sweet, super nourishing, super rejuvenating. Like it's such a powerful food to eat. Anybody that knows about it here eats as much of it as they possibly can. When you have access to it, plus panini means don't touch. The prickly pear cactus is kind of almost telling you, hey, don't mess around, don't touch me. But we do touch it and we do check it out. And, you know, I have tools and skills and armor. And, uh, you know, so I go deal with them and see if you can see this waterfall at all behind me. It's kind of way down there in the bush, but wow, there's a waterfall back down there. So. Very nice. Very nice. That's great. What about figs? Do you grow figs out there? I grow a lot of figs. Yeah. All the ficus loves to grow out here. Fig is a ficus, jackfruit, even the banyan tree is a ficus and they all grow out here really, really well, really wildly. Now fig is one of those trees, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this, how I was told alpacas only eat grass. Well, no, they will definitely eat fig trees. Any chance they get, they'll eat every single leaf right off of that fig tree and they'll eat all the figs. So when fig season comes, I keep the alpacas out of the orchard. Now of all the fruit trees you have, what's the tallest? The tallest, the tallest would either be that weird bunya you know about the bunya bunya no i don't the bunya bunya nut the bunya bunya nut it, it's like pine nuts it's like a pine tree it's wow. some big spiky pine tree thing so the bunya bunya that's a pretty tall tree but jackfruit you know jackfruit's probably gonna be my tallest tree here on the property until the durian reaches height when the durian reaches height, the durians are sometimes 100 feet tall here in Hawaii. So they're one of the tallest trees that we see on the islands for fruit trees. But the jackfruits are 60 foot trees, you know, so jackfruits wow. rival in a lot of ways. And jackfruits will hit that 40 to 60 yeah. foot height within 20 years, whereas it could be 50 years until the durian is that high. So, you know, we do have some really tall trees that happen here. 
but they're also environmental. Like I know a lot of durian trees that never made it over 20 feet, you know, and they just bushed out and got bushy at that height. And those are on Avalau. Those are where I live. But that tree that I go pick out in Nahiku that's 50 years old, you know, that thing's got to be 60 to 80 feet tall, that durian already. And I think it's going to go taller. And that's not the tallest one that I know. I know a hundred foot durian wow, tree. It's, re it's really, <laughs> it's really sad in uh, Hawaii in uh, Malaysia. It's very sad. Uh, there's a fight going on now between the government and the farmers. Because a lot of the durian trees that have been grown for years by families are on wild land. And uh, the government's okay. saying they want part of the, the money or they're going to cut the trees down. But they're, they're well, asking for too much. And so they're cutting whole uh, orchards of uh, durian trees down, like like 100-year-old trees. They're just cutting down and like cutting. And it's just really sad what's going on there. Dang, that's yeah. terrible. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, that's where they Im import a lot of stuff right now is being imported from there. So I'm sure they're seeing the business and they just want a cut of the money. I'm trying to pull out the bag of graviolins here in my freezer for you so you can see. That's... Graviolins. That's the bright orange durian, right? Wow. Wow. And it tastes like it tastes like peanut butter, right? Like here's like, let me see if I can find you more common. You know, we have a lot of different varieties that they're selling right now out here. All from that Indonesia. They're all these Indonesian varieties. Oops, there. See that one? That's more your regular kind, like what you're used to seeing. You know, like, but this stuff's special, man. That graviolins, there's like nothing so, like so it. The they sell those out they sell those uh, from there and they grow them there and sell them there these are from indonesia uh, okay. ryan who runs the biggest produce scene here on maui he's kind of like the biggest farmers market booth you know at the farmers market he used to be the head of produce at mana foods at the health food store back when you probably came to visit yeah. and and so he has a, he imports that from indonesia every year he brings in boxes and boxes i i had the card for you i put it somewhere the other day because i was like oh paul needs this card but let me i'm gonna go in my office real quick i'm gonna take a quick peek i don't well, know if just, i yeah text me that I'll, I'll, ma I'll mail it to you later on i'll, I'll yeah. send it to you because so, i think you're really gonna want it you know so, like, <laughs> absolutely absolutely so if somebody uh is in maui and they want to look you up do you open your for tours to the public or like yeah. have, so people yeah we do tours all the time Okay, I'm going to put your link below the video and I hope to come there one day and actually be filming from there and eating fruit from your trees. Uh, yeah, bro, awesome. come anytime, please. Please come out. Yeah. Anybody come get in touch. Uh, we run a sauna club on Sunday. We do tours. We have exotic fruit. Uh, you can come meet the animals. We do fruit picking tours. We do planting tours, survivalist yeah. tours, enchanted farm tours for the kids with unicorns and mermaids and dragons, haunted tours about the history of upcountry's ghosts. So yeah, certainly come out and yeah, visit. A lot of stuff going on there. I'll put your, I'm going to put your website uh, below the video here in the description. So your website has all that information? Yeah, avalaufarm.com or jeremysaffron.com. Both those will help you find all my stuff and get in touch with me. And I'm on Facebook and Insta and TikTok and all that. Now, uh, how, much, how, many, how much help do you have on your farm? Because I know like Not enough. here, there's a lot of, <laughs> you got you to gotta do weeding and you got to just, you, you still, uh, farming takes a lot of maintenance. So is it just you or do you have a crew come there every day to help you? Uh, it's it, the crew. You, you saw a lot of the crew. You got to see a whole bunch of the crew just now. You realize who they are, right? You and the animals. The animals. The yes. animals are my crew. Yeah. Those alpaca go and lead everything and eat all the weeds and the you know, sheep and the tortoise and you know, the horses. And you know, my crew is pretty much creatures. But I also have people, you're correct, there are people, God, I'm looking for a charging cable. Uh, but, uh, also, we do have people that come here every week and help us one day a week. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Jeremy. This was a great tour. Uh, we didn't get to see a lot of your trees, but we got so much information and we, we, we just know it's amazing out there. And uh, you're, you're, you're amazing. The whole place is amazing. So anything you want to so say much. about the trees or anything before we, we finish? Well, yeah, I mean, just spend time with your fruit trees and get to know them and, you know, treat them like a friend. And, you know, don't don't always listen to the book. Listen to the tree before you listen to the book. And, uh, you know, certainly spend time with them because they're there to share with you. And one of the biggest things that I've noticed about fruit trees is that when I consciously receive fruit from the tree, when I go out there and pick that fruit that it's making when it's ripe or right before it's ripe, it makes more fruit.
And if I let the fruit drop and ignore it and forget about it, because it's just sitting there and I'm not interested, it actually makes less fruit the next year and next year after that. And so really there is an exchange, there is an interaction. The fruit trees want you to pick that fruit. So remember that. Wow, that's really cool. You know, where I am here, I have uh, I do uh, the high in, uh, intensity gardening very close, and I got to keep the trees short because I only have one acre of land, and uh, I have to worry about people because it's in a residential neighborhood on the street picking the fruit. So there's so many different challenges where I am in the city compared to where you are. But I know you, uh, you know, you say you don't have challenges, but I know there's challenges because when you're growing, you're up to uh, it's up to the weather and everything else, and uh, yeah. You know, so it's uh, but it's it's all good. All it's all wonderful, and it's so great to have you on. And everybody, this is just one of the farms in Hawaii. Now, do you have other growers that might be interested in coming on the show and uh, doing this? So we can see that tree. Oh, def definitely, definitely. I mean, Chuck Warner, you should definitely get on here. The guy who owns Ono Farms, one of the biggest organic fruit tree, exotic fruit trees in the state, and the first person to ever feed me a Rilenia. So wow. you know. Definitely get Chuck Warner on here from Ono Farms. Please, no, uh, please hook us up. Yeah, uh, Stephen, uh, you know that guy Stephen with the, all the fruit trees out here? He's very famous guy here, has tons and tons of exotics. Um, there's this girl, Sylvia Yordorva, and she goes out there and films. So she might be someone you could get to go out there for you and film some stuff out at his place. Uh, of course, Twin Falls. Twin Falls is another place that, you know, Freedom owns. And that place has a ton of fruit. That place is, you know, 35, 40 years of fruit tree planting on it. And so, yeah, wow. a lot of tree farms. Yeah, you'll have get. to send me that list. I'll contact all of them and try to get them on. And uh, everybody, awesome. if you ever go to Hawaii, definitely look up Jeremy. His link's below. Jeremy, thanks again for joining us. Good seeing you. Aloha.